You know what? 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So that's what the heartbeat of this church is. Right? There were men who committed their lives to me. And they trained me and taught me. And you know what I'm trying to do? Take what they gave me and give it to you. And then you know what we're supposed to, you're supposed to do? Take it and give it to someone else. Amen. And that's just the way it works. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So before we get started, I need, I need to, to, to petition help. Okay? Because I need some help this morning. Amen? So let's look to the Lord. Father, Lord, uh, I'm so grateful to you that you have counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And Lord, my prayer is that I would never take this responsibility lightly. But Lord, as you have committed your word to me, I am committing it to other people. And my prayer is that they would commit it to those who you have placed in their life. So that we can impact this city in a much greater way than the Kansas City Chiefs have impacted this city. Lord, you are worthy of a much higher praise than Patrick Mahomes. Lord, here's my prayer today. As we go through your word, open our ears, open our hearts, and he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying here, and I pray, Lord, that we, it would just not be information, Lord, but it would help us in our transformation to the image of Jesus Christ. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we are studying the keys to Bible study. And let me tell you why this is critically important for this church. If we are ever going to grow individually, we need to have an individual understanding of the Word of God so that we develop a passionate love for, for God. Amen? Amen? The Scripture teaches that Christ is the Word. And so often we say we love God and we love Jesus Christ. But if you so if you love Jesus Christ, then you love the Word. Right? The issue then becomes this. How do I gain something in my own personal life? Study of God's Word. Yeah, teens can leave, kids can leave. Our kids. Amen. How do I go into this book so that I desire every single morning to get into it? I can't wait till morning comes. I tell people about what I studied all day. I put it on my Facebook page. I tell it to my coworkers. And because I am passionately in love with the Word of God, which makes me passionately in love with God. Amen. How do we get there? Or how do we move from me giving you the word of God, me telling you the word of God, to you having your own personal understanding of the book so you can study it on your own? Amen. This cannot be about me. It must be about him. Amen. He must increase and all of us need to decrease. Amen. Right? So, so that's why we're studying this thing. So our purpose is, is to help our, the members, specifically of this church, to, to not just read the word, but to understand what they are reading. Because the scripture says that we're to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right to do what? Right, dividing the word of truth. So we need to know how to rightly divide it because when we rightly divide it, we get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So two weeks ago, we started looking at these keys to Bible study, okay? And, and, and the key that we be, began looking at was this key number three, which is the context key, okay? And we began this key by looking at two important principles, and the first principle that I have up here would be the principle of audience. If you're going to understand how to determine the context of the, of the Bible, you need to first understand who is it written to. 
I'm reading in this book, I'm reading in Galatians, I'm reading in Romans, I'm reading in Philippians, I'm reading in the Old Testament, I'm reading a passage of scripture, I'm reading through Jeremiah, I'm reading through, through Genesis. Who is the audience? If you don't determine that, then you'll end up trying to make it fit where it can't fit. Or you don't understand the, 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 who it's written to. And we look at the fact that it, and it says in 1 Corinthians 10.32 that it's written to three groups of people, the Jews, Gentiles, and then members of this new race of people called the body of Christ, the church of, of God. Amen. Those are the three groups of people that the Bible is written to. Amen. You have to understand that first, and then from that determine who is that passage of scripture written, written to, specifically. Okay? Now, I gave you, last week, the second principle. And it is the principle of content. And what we looked at specifically is the fact that biblical context is determined by doing what? Keeping the specific verse being examined and interpreted. Watch this. Within the context that has been revealed within the content of the whole book which, in which it is located. You, you can't just pick up the Bible and start reading. You have to apply principles to it. No different than if you were to take an English class. You can't pick it up and try to get mad out of it. Right? You take a math class, you look for math. You take an English class, you look for English. No different, and I'm speaking to a handful of people in here this morning, right? When J.R. read the scripture reading, if you're new to us, you will find that all of us were reading from the same kind, the same book, right? So all of you, and if you have a different version, you go, well, mine doesn't read that way. Well, I'm going to give you the simple way because it's much deeper. You wouldn't show up at an English class and just bring your own English book. <laughs> right. right? You're going to get the text that is, that is part of that class right. for the curriculum. You can't decide and walk, you walk into a physics class and then you go in there and you have a biology book. Well, no, you're never going to get anything out of it. So we all read from the same text. Okay? And I was thinking of this as J.R. was reading it. Do you know why, why one of the most difficult groups of people to ever win out of, or, or and we all agree, would probably agree that Jehovah's Witness, you know, we have our opinion of them, right? But 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 you know why they're so strong and so difficult to penetrate? They all use the same book. Mm -hmm. They don't have a different book. They all use the same book. They don't have every version of, of, of Bible in there. Now, I don't necessarily agree with their version of Bible, right? But they, they all use the same uh, new, it's called the New World Translation. And they all use it. And you know what it has made them? Almost impenetrable as a group. So, let's look at what we gave you last week to consider. What we did was we ask you to consider to put a verse, that to put a verse in its true biblical context, if you don't have this, you need to take a picture of it if you weren't here last week. You need to take a picture of this because this will help you to understand your Bible. Okay? First, we have to consider the passage of Scripture that we're reading. Okay? What is this passage teaching? You can't just read the Bible and say, okay, it says this, okay? Secondly, we have to consider the chapter that we're reading. What is this chapter of the Bible trying to teach? What is it that they are trying to teach in this chapter of Scripture so that I'm not reading into it, I'm reading what it says, okay? And then thirdly, you have to consider the book. Now I'm in Romans, now I'm in Galatians, now I'm in Philippians. What is the purpose of that book. Amen. You have to, if you're ever going to get anything out of your Bible study, you cannot just pick up the Bible and start reading it and say, I, and then put it down halfway when you wake up. 
and say, I got nothing out of my study today. You have to approach it properly. And then what you have to do for it is you have to consider it in the, in the Bible. What, what, consider what is it teaching? What is a particular book in the Bible? So last week, we looked at our first example, and I'm not going to go through it again. We looked at a verse in Scripture that I believe if you're going to be out here witnessing to people, and you're going to be out here trying to teach people the Bible and tell them about your faith, you will come across a group of people who teach that Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 will teach you not only that you must be baptized to be saved, and they use that particular verse to say that baptism is essential to salvation, and they use that particular verse to say to you, that in order for you to receive the Holy Ghost, you must be baptized. Mm -hmm. And there's only one way to look at, at that passage of Scripture, right? You have to consider the passage. What is the passage teaching? You have to consider the chapter. What is that chapter 2 in the book of Acts teaching? You have to consider the book. What is the book of Acts? Right, we talked about the fact that the book of Acts is the what? Acts of the apostles, right? Which means that it's a transitional book because the apostles were the ones who took us from Old Testament to New Testament, right? So until you get to a certain portion in Acts, you can't even apply it to the New Testament church because up until you get to that portion, there was no New Testament church. Mm -hmm. So unless you apply it that way, when you get to the second chapter of the book of Acts, you can take that verse and pull it out. And I didn't put it up there, right? I probably should have. You, have, you can just pull that verse out and say, that's what, as a matter of fact, let's turn to it. Real quick, for Denisha's sake. I'm just kidding. I knew you were here. I'm going to go ahead and get you. You never go to a comedian or a comedy show. The worst place you can sit is on the front row. Right? You get best with so all of you on the front row and get ready. All right, here we go. Look at what it says in verse 38. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and ye shall see the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you know what? If I just pull that verse out of its context, you know what it says? You need to be baptized to be saved, to have your sins remitted. And if you, once you do that baptism, you'll get the Holy Ghost. That's what the verse says. But it doesn't say that when you put it in its context. When you look at the book that it's written in, when you look at the chapter that it was written in, you realize very quickly that it was written to the nation of Israel. It had nothing to do with the New Testament church. And what he was doing was telling them how that, that because they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, in order for their sin to be remitted for, for crucifying him, that they needed to repent, be baptized, and for then God would give them the Holy Ghost nation of Israel, not New Testament church. You have to be careful. See, so in its, context, in its proper context, even though I might say something and people pull it out, that's not, it, that's not exactly what it says. I and mean, you know, and I've said this and, and because it's true, none of us like to have our words taken out of context. Right. That's why I don't like Facebook. And text messaging, right? People, people text me. They don't, they don't, they don't call. I'm, can I let most of the Pam, Pam, since you're on the front row, I'm let you in on the secret. If you want to communicate with me, I'm almost 60 years old. Call me. And we can have a conversation. But if you text me, I may not answer you. I just may not answer you. You know, and then I say, Someone will say something and I'll say, no. And they'll say, Pastor Ray, man, he just, he, but now he's mad at me. Because <laughs> he said, no. Is that how I said it? And it with, with, with quotation marks. You know, because then if you cap it, then that means that you're shouting. Isn't that what it is? I know. Right? And if you put quotation marks, that means that you really meant it. 
right? I mean, we got all this stuff. And you know what we do? We take what people write out of context. And that's exactly what we do to God's word, is that we take it out of context, what he wrote, and unless you apply the right principles, you have to be careful in how you approach the word of God. Let me tell you something. Our reason for doing this is so that we're all on one accord here when we study the word, the word of God, and we're not all talking different stuff. Amen. Okay? <clears throat> so, let's look at another passage of scripture this morning. That many of us use to, people use to teach, or Paul stopped, I have three verses that we're going to look at. Just slow down, Carol, with me, because I don't want you to take my punch away. Right. Yeah. Wanda? <laughs> no, you're good. You can go ahead and turn it down. The punch is over. So, <laughs> many people use this verse to teach, Paul Stotch. And we're going to use the same principle once again to see how to go about determining or what is being said here. And let's not just pull a verse out of context and use it to support a, a hold on, not just what we believe, but church doctrine. We can go that far, right? Right? So, so, so we're going to use the same principle to do this. And, and the verses, go ahead, uh, uh, Carol, Galatians 5, 4. Okay? This is what it says. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are, um, of you, are justified by the law. And here's the one that they get. You are fallen from grace. And they use this verse to say that you can fall from grace. In other words, that you can lose your salvation. Okay? Now, people that propagate this teaching, that it is possible to fall from grace and lose your salvation, and then, you, which means that if you lose it, you would then need to get saved again. Right? So we, so, so we have to look at that verse because what Paul doing here is this. He's definitely talking about a group of people who have fallen from grace. That much we can tell from the verse. Okay? So what do you do with this verse? If someone says that to you and they pull that verse out of context. Okay? So let's apply the same principle that we did last week and go back through this passage. I have two of them to look at, so we need to get moving. First of all, we want to look at this. We want to look at why is this book in the Bible, and what is the book of Galatians that goes in your blank, so you should be filling in your blank on your notes by now. Okay, your handout that was given. If someone needs a handout, raise their hand. If you're in need of a handout, okay? What is the book of Galatians actually doing in the Bible? Why did Paul write to this region of Galatia? Okay? So as we study this book, it's not difficult to see that God chose to use this book to teach this. Hear me. The fact that Gentiles are free from the law and have been freed from the law. Amen. Okay? Hallelujah. Or what we would call Judaism. Mm -hmm. We're not under that law. Yes. Okay? That's what he's using the book for. Now, Judaism is the teaching of the Jews or what we would call their Jewish faith. Now, the reason you know that is because of the book of Galatians. That's why that book is in the book, and we actually learn from what's going on and how this, why this book was written in the first place. Now, this is where you would find this. This is what was happening. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Here's the reason that it was necessary for him to write this book. Now, you have to know that in the book of Acts, it covers books of the Bible as well because it's transitional, so it actually will cover 
portions of Rome, Romans, portions of Acts, I mean of Galatians, of other books, right? Because it, it, it takes us this chronological acts of the apostles. And here was what was going on. It says, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, here it is, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses. That that would be the manner of the, that the, the, of the Old Testament system. He said, you cannot be saved. Now that was a common, hey, I understand why they taught that. As they are transitioning out of the Old Testament, where they had been given the law, all of a sudden God then allows Gentiles into the ch through the church to come into this relationship with God. See, they were the only ones who would receive the oracles of God. And in order to receive what they did, you know what you had to do? You had to be circumcised. So their thinking is, okay, if you're going to let Gentiles in, then they need to be circumcised. Right? That was a natural teaching. And that was what they taught. What they did not realize is that God, through Christ, had fulfilled the law. Right? So that you and I don't gain righteousness through what we do. We, get, we obtain righteousness by what he did. So it was natural for them to believe that in order to receive this relationship with God, that you had to be circumcised. And they were, not only did they believe it, they came from Judea teaching it. And they was lining them up. They was getting knives and they were saying, all right, man, here we go. It's time to you, you, you want you want God, you want our God? Then you do it our way. And God said, no, 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 no. That's not how we're going to do this. It, you, he, here's, here's the reason we're not going to do it, uh, Israel. I gave you every opportunity to accept Messiah. You rejected him and crucified him on the cross. We're not going to do it your way anymore. We're going to do it a new way. And guess what, what, so guess what the Apostle Paul had to do? He had to go to the region of Galatia and write a letter to them and explain to them, this thing has changed, people. <laughs> That's the purpose of the book. And if you don't understand that first, you're going to take that verse in Galatians, you're going to pull it out of context, and you're going to say it, it does something that it does not do. Yes, yes. You, mean, you ought to have this in your Bible, because I'm telling you, if you're dealing with, a certain, with various people, they're going to pull, that verse has been pulled on me a hundred times for people. If you are witnessing that, if you are just talking about the chief, they have no reason to pull out that. <laughs> if that is where your, your conversation is, you know, Patrick Mahomes has nothing to do with that, bro. Okay, I'm going to mess with y'all about the chief today. And, and, and let me tell you something. Kane, wait till 540 when the game comes. <laughs> but we're going to put it in the context for this moment. Okay, because I'm a chief's fan. Dog, love him. I had season tickets for years. I'd rather have church today. Amen. 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 Just who I am. And I don't knock people for loving, you know, their team. You know, let's love them. So Paul comes to this region of Galatia. And that's what it is. It's a region. It's not necessarily a city. Right? And Galatia is what we call modern day Turkey. Okay? So as Paul comes into that region, the message that he was proclaiming was this: that grace, by but that that by grace through faith, apart from the law, apart from any of the rules and regulations of the Old Testament, that Gentiles are now being allowed into this relationship with Christ. Yes. That was his purpose in writing. So what happened? Thank you, dear. <laughs> so what happens is false teachers, or the, what we refer to as Judaizers, okay, people who were jealous, zealous for the, the, the Jewish faith and the Jewish system of law, they taught that it was kind of cute 
what Paul was telling them that by grace they can be saved through faith. But they wanted people to understand that if they really wanted to be saved and for sure if they wanted to be spiritual, they were going to have to keep the law and do that by outwardly expressing the fact that they believed in Judaism by being circumcised. Okay? And they were putting that requirement on Gentiles. That's what had happened in the region of Galatia. They were doing, giving this false teaching. So, the purpose of the book of Galatians being in the Bible is really stated here in Galatians 2.21. This is what Paul says. Look at what he says. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by me being circumcised or me, watch this, because you're going to hear this one. Me keeping the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. How many people you know say, that's what we're supposed to do is just keep the Ten Commandments? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a painter. And I'm witnessing to the pain of my house, and I'm trying to witness to, to Matt, the painter. And he goes back. He, I'm, I'm laying the gospel on Matt. I'm laying it thick, too. Right? And Matt goes back to work, and one of his co he tells his co worker, right? First sign that he got saved. Because he couldn't wait to go tell somebody. Amen. Right? If I had told him, go and tell no man, you know what he would have did? He would have went and told everybody. Because he went to work the next day and he told somebody, he said, I'm, I'm working at this guy's house and this is what he shared with me. And you know what the guy told him? Because Matt's like, I'm still confused because we hadn't finished yet. I'm still, I'm trying to, you know, give it to him. Not stuff it down his throat, right? And the guy tells him, he said, he said, that's simple. You just need to learn how to keep the commandments. No, I can't fault that guy. He believed that. He wasn't trying to give Matt false doctrine. He wasn't trying to hurt him. He wasn't trying to tell. He was really deeply in his heart believe that our responsibility is to keep the Ten Commandments. You know what this verse says? He says, I frustrate the grace of God. What is the grace of God? The unmerited favor of God, right? You didn't earn it. You did nothing to get it. Christ did everything. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the fence and stayed. He washed it. I ain't washed nothing. Amen. Right? Christ is the one who did it all. He said, if, 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 if I don't frustrate what Christ did for me, he says, for if righteousness come by me doing something, then Christ is dead in vain. Why did he die on the cross if I can earn my salvation? Amen. Mm -hmm. If I can do this thing myself, why do I need the people live that way, do they not? Amen. They believe as if they really don't need God. You know, I earn this. I'm the one who pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I'm the one who goes to work every day. I'm the one who earned his paycheck. I'm the one who does all this. Don't tell me what he did for me. I don't need him. Okay. Okay. You know why I don't fault that person? You know why I don't fault a person that believes that way? Because but for the grace of God, that was me. Yes. Yes. I was the guy who believed that way. I did for years. I came out of Islam. I believed that Muhammad and the tenets of Islam were the way to God. And it was all earned. Yeah. I was the bro I was the brother with the bow tie selling the bean pie. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke, but y'all didn't hear that. So here we go. <laughs> Some people understand what I'm talking about. Paul says, make sure that you don't frustrate God's grace by thinking that you were made righteous or spiritual by something you do or something you don't do. Mm -hmm. In this case, for them, it was specifically circumcision. It was, a big, it was the, 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 what was on the table. Okay? In other words, by the works of the law, what Paul says here, in doing so, you frustrate the whole purpose of grace. Mm -hmm. And what it does. He said that it frustrates the whole purpose of Christ's death. He says if we can be spiritual by something we do or don't do, then why did Christ go to the cross and die a horrible death? Mm. If that's true, 
then we should skip the whole debt of Christ so that we can just be justified by the law. It's the purpose of Galatians. That's why he wrote the book. You should have that in your notes at the beginning of the Bible. So that now when you're reading through your Bible and you get to the book of Galatians, you're not reading something into it. You understand exactly why that book was written. So let's look at the context of the book. What is the real teaching? Or the purpose? What we find in second, as we find in 2 Timothy 2.15, it talks about how uh, we we or work, right? It, in the, it is the book that does this. And you, I didn't put this in here, but you want to write this down next to this little section. The book of Galatians is the book that teaches saved people how to be spiritual. Mm. Letting them know what to do by what not to do. That is the context. So when we come to the Galatians 5.4, which is our verse that we're looking at, we're going to run this thing first through the context. So then next, here's number four. What is the context of the chapter? Chapter 5. So now we're going to come to Galatians 5 and we see the whole purpose. And this is what it is. The purpose of chapter 5 was to teach us how to walk. How do you walk? If you want to be spiritual, okay, how do you then walk as a believer? Okay? And he says this in Galatians 5.16. He says, this I say then. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, 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 we know that none of us were born with the Spirit of God living in us, right? right? But once you are, once you do have the person of the Spirit of God living in you, you're to then walk in Him, mm -hmm. right? You're to learn to walk in Him because by nature, we automatically fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why do we fulfill the, I had this conversation with someone this, this week. We fulfill the lust of our flesh because what we were given at the beginning was a conscience. We were not given the Holy Spirit of God. So because you have a conscience and not the Holy Spirit of God, that then makes it so that you have a void. You have an emptiness. So what we end up trying to do by fulfilling the lust of the flesh is fill up this void that we have, right? And, we, and there's a number of ways we can do it. Right? Sex, cars, houses, work. I ain't speaking to everybody in here. Don't be turning around, JR, because you're all talking. Uh -huh. Right? 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 Stuff, clothes, you know, uh, things. We, we, because we're empty. So the only way to fill it up, here, I, and I say this respectfully, and I, and I mean this to be true, because I, I came out of Islam. All my brothers and sisters are still Muslim. Yeah. Okay? I have a sister that lives, uh, she, I'll, I'll be 60 this year, she just turned 61. No, yes. She just turned 61, right? And she has spent her life indulging herself in her education. Mm -hmm. now, ain't nothing wrong with that. Amen? Amen. Amen. But for her, it's to fill a void. Yeah. Yeah. Can be. That's right. She don't have the spirit of God. Right. She's trying to fill an emptiness. Yeah. So she just stays in school. She's been in school for since she's been, I'm telling you, this child is always in, in, in school. <laughs> oh. Master's degree in in, in uh, uh, nursing. Working on her dark. I mean, she's getting ready to finish. I mean, hallelujah! Mm -hmm. As long as she don't think it feels that, it, that it, it's going to fill mm -hmm. that empty spot in her yeah. that can only be filled by the Spirit of God. Amen. 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 Preach it, teach it. I love her, but I try to get her saved every time I see her or hear her. Okay, we, we don't talk often. She's only a year, she's 13 months older than I. You know, I love her to death. Uh, 
Right. So, let's look at the next verse here in Galatians 5.25. He says this in, in this chapter. He says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk. If you're, if, if, right? So if we're going to be spiritual, we must walk in the spirit. It's all about walking in the spirit. How do you walk? Not in the flesh, not in, in you know what I'm saying? Not in, 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 a, uh, in, in doing something for God. Paul understood something that even a one-year-old baby can understand, and that is this. There's a priority that we must set in action before you can actually walk. You know what's the first thing you have to do before you can walk? Crawl. crawl. And after you crawl, then you gotta what? Take the first step. You gotta stand. Oh, okay. You don't just go from crawling to just walking. Yeah. You first, you ever seen. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, Try right. To learn. That's what a Christian's got to do. In their faith. Right. You know, because we expect that a person gets saved and all of a sudden they're walking. Oh, no, 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 no. You, got, you know what you're going to do when you first get saved? You're going to screw this thing up. <laughs> Our problem is that the reason that many people don't ever overcome and they become mature believers is because. So-called mature believers put this pressure on them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they can't make a mistake in the faith. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, you can. Amen. I'm a witness. It happened to me. I was a disaster. Man, let me tell you. I wasn't just like this. I, was, I had scarred up knees, elbows, <laughs> chin. Because I was coming out of this line. So it was easy for me. That's why I'm sensitive to people when they when they when they screw up. I, you know, just here's the problem. If you got a 30 year old who's still trying to change his diaper, something's wrong. Amen. Yeah. At some point you should mature. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when you first get saved and you mess up and you're not at Bible study the way that you need to, I'm good with that. But when you've been here for any length of time and you still don't have it together, mm -hmm. something's wrong. Okay. If we're going to, to be spiritual, we must be walk in the spirit. It's all about walking in the spirit. So you learn how to stand. The problem that the Galatians had is that they couldn't do either. They couldn't walk and they couldn't stand. That was the context of the chapter. So then let's move to the context of the passage that we're, that we're talking about today. And what we find is Paul's admonition to their fallen state and the solution to their problem, if you will, was not just so to get saved. That's not what he's talking about. He tells them to get up and stand again. When a baby falls, you don't say, just stay there. You say, no, 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 get up. Come on, baby. Right? Get up and get back on your feet. The teaching of the Judaizers had knocked them down so that you've fallen down and you can't walk in that position. So get up! Stand! He says. So look at Galatians 5 1. He says this in the start of the chapter. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ had made us free. Amen. Free from what? Free from the law. Amen. He says, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage to the law. Yes. That was the context of the, of, of the, of the chapter. Mm -hmm. Their attempt to keep the law was what, was what had entangled them and what eventually caused them to fall. It was the law that did it. So he says, stand on your own two spiritual feet so that by the time we get to verse 16, you can walk. Amen. You can walk not in the power of the flesh, not what you do for God, but in the power of, uh, of the Spirit, okay? What God, uh, or it was what God will do to you now that you are saved. It was not by the works of the law, but by the grace that God has given you through faith. Amen. So, having set the content, for why the chapter's in the Bible, what the book is actually teaching, what the chapter is actually teaching, and what the passage 
religious teaching. What is the real teaching of the verse? Now break it down. So, we can find out in Galatians 4 what he's actually saying and looking at what he's not, by looking at what he's not saying. He's not saying that from the unrighteousness of your life, you can fall out of God's grace. Right. Yes. Yes. Instead, what he's saying is through your attempts to do righteousness by the law, you are falling from the very thing that you place your faith in, your trust in, yes. in the first place, yes. which was grace, right? Mm -hmm. And you got, if you got saved by grace through faith, mm -hmm. then stand in the grace and don't go try back to try to be righteous by being doing the law. That's, right. That's what he was saying. Hallelujah. Right? People do that all the time. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. You got saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. It was a gift from God, not of words, lest any man should boast. But now you want to go back to being this works-oriented Christian. And you put yourself right back under the law. And as a result, you know what you end up doing? You fall from the very thing that saved you, which was grace. You could do you could trusting in the grace of God and start trusting in you. That's what Paul was right. Do you know what the crazy thing about Galatians 5 for is? The people that use this verse to teach that you can lose your salvation think that the verse is referring to those who have lost their salvation. Do you know what the reality is? The verse is actually directed to them. It's directed to those who teach that you can lose your salvation and teach that there is nothing that you can do that you nothing that you have to do or do to be righteous or spiritual, and his indictment on the passage is on those, that group of people. What he's saying in the verse is this: You've fallen from the very thing, the only thing that could actually make you spiritual, and that was grace. What he's trying to say to them is that you are then, you know what you're doing? You're frustrating the grace of God. Oh yes, yes, yeah. yeah. so frustrating. You know what the grace of God is? Simple. It's pretty simple, right? Christ died for your sin. Was buried, rose again on the third day. You did nothing. Don't frustrate that. Don't try to make that complicated. You know what we do? People who frustrate the grace of God, they, they have a difficult time witnessing to people because then they try to add to it. Can't add nothing to what Christ did. Amen. Let me tell you, you can't add one thing to what Christ did. But this is what you were better than. You did nothing. You can't, you did absolutely nothing. And don't think for a second, as we saw in Acts 2.38 last week, that baptism is going to save you. Because you know what baptism is? Works. It's an outward expression of it. Something that took place inward. Your baptism can't save you. I love to say it, I'll say it again this week. The, we going to baptize here soon, because i got several people that need to be baptized. The independent water system does. There ain't nothing spiritual about it. Amen. As a matter of fact, I think Lee Summit water tastes bad. <laughs> no. no. Okay. It doesn't. You know why it doesn't? Because it's just water. <laughs> Dawn and I went to, to Europe and we went to the Vatican. And you know, and they so you go into the Vatican and they have these bottles with the Pope. Space on it. And it's both and it says holy water. Yeah. <laughs> now, do you realize that some guys in the Vatican are poor? Just, yeah, that's right. Holy water. And people flocking in. Oh. That water came from, from the, the water system in, in, the, in Vatican City, Italy. There ain't nothing spiritual about it. That's why you have to be careful. Hear me. We have to be careful with trying to make physical application in the New Testament using physical things to replicate spiritual things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just spoke to somebody. Amen. <laughs> so let's look at this last verse so I can get y'all out of here. Y'all all ready to go. Y'all, how many people have read all of these? So here we go. 
up. I got red. I got red on my So let's look at one last verse. And it's a big one. Here's the verse. It's in Hebrews. Okay. Here's a, here's our second, the last verse we're gonna look at in the context, and then we're gonna move on next week. Okay. It says this. This is one of those verses that people pull out of context. I just want you to look at it at face value. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and had tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto a, I'm telling you, this is a serious verse. To renew them again unto repentance, see, they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Hmm. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Now, I just pulled that verse out of its context. I can teach a whole lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you have to apply the rules to Bible study, people. You have to have the key. If you listen to what I'm telling you to get these verses, you won't be all screwed up when someone comes along and teaches you and says, here it is. That's what it says. Is that what they do? They say, that's what it says. Are you going to say that's not what it says? So what you going to do with that now, uh, Grace and Truth member? <laughs> You think you go with grace and truth, learning something. Well, we do something with that. Person. And then we'd be like this. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that, man. Hold on. Let me call my pastor. <laughs> pastor, somebody show me this verse. Can you help me? Well, yeah. Show up on. If you'd have been here last Sunday, see, you weren't here last Sunday. And I taught how you build that verse. But you weren't here. You was busy getting ready for the 540 Chiefs game. Anyway, so I'm going to use the Chiefs today. So, do you know what? You, what do you do with that? Somebody says that to you. So what's the first thing we have to determine? The context, the context of the book. Audience. Right? The context of audience. You have to apply that. Right? So, number one. That's number one. Go ahead, uh, Carol. Right, the context of the book of <coughs> Hebrews. <coughs> Somebody say Hebrews. Hebrews. We can go home. You know why? Because unless you're a Hebrew, even though that book is in the New Testament, that book is written to specifically Hebrews. And God placed it in the New Testament for a reason. <coughs> Be careful trying to make, watch this, church doctrine out of anything in Hebrew. That's not to say you can't take principles out of Hebrew and use it, right? But you can't make doctrine out of it, okay? So, of all we notice in the terms of this particular book, being in the Bible, it has to do with Jews and Hebrews. It's not addressed to Gentiles. It's not addressed to the church. It's addressed to Hebrews. And the specific reason it's in the Bible is to open Hebrews or Jews to their Messiah. Because you know what? They rejected Christ. So God put a book in the New Testament because they only believe in the Old Testament. But something's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen in the tribulation period. And they're going to go to the New Testament and they're going to see some specific books that were written specific to them. Amen. And you know what? You know one of those, three of those, uh, well, two of them, you know what they are? First it said Peter. You know why Peter? Because who is Peter? Apostle. He's the apostle to the Jews. So you know what? There's books in the New Testament that was written by their apostles. We will go by the writings of the Apostle Paul. That's not to say you can't pull principles out of Peter. Amen. But a Jew, when he sees Peter's name, you know what he says? He perks up. Immediately. He perks up because he goes, okay, that's the Apostle that leads to us. 
Now what's this book? What's this book of Hebrews doing in the New Testament? There's a reason. Okay? And here's one of them. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Now, now, I'm going to read this verse and then I'll say something real quick. This is Paul. He, he wrote this. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. And here's the mystery. Lest you should be wise in your conceit, semicolon, right? Because he's going to explain that blindness in heart is happening to Israel. And how long is that blindness going to be? Until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. You got to understand that verse. See, here's, here, I, wrote, I can be on this all day. So there's a group of people who we call replacement theologists. They believe in what we call replacement theology. And their theology is that the New Testament church has replaced Israel. So that all of the promises that God gave to Israel now come to us. You know why that's a violation of scripture? Because that would mean that when God gave Abraham promises in Genesis chapter 12, he didn't actually mean it. They, those promises were conditional and they lost them. Let me tell you something about, and I said this, I say this almost every Sunday. When God promises something, God's promises are true. Amen. He says it, he meant it. Amen. He can't go back on his promises. If he does, then he's a liar. And the God I serve, he ain't no liar. Amen. So, you know what he's done? He says, blindness has happened to Israel in part until I'm finished done with the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And right now, he's dealing with us. Amen. Right? He's dealing with the Gentiles. You know who, and you've heard me say this, if, Putin, I mean, if, if Netanyahu wants to get anything, guess who he's got to go through? A Gentile king. Mm -hmm. Israel don't have no pull in the world. Everybody hates him. Most people don't believe him. Most people are anti-Semitic. Yeah. They don't believe, but God never intended that. That's why he set Solomon up in his rule and his reign, and he set up David as king, and he set up all these people, the nation of Israel, because he, he had a purpose for them. Mm -hmm. But you know what they did? Crucified Messiah. Mm -hmm. But you know what God did? He backed off of them. He said, I'm going to bring in Gentiles. But blindness is only going to be in part until I'm done with the Gentile church. And then guess what I'm going to do? Christ is going to come. He's going to rule and reign again. Right? Now, I'm going to say this, even though I believe that this guy will never, ever, 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 ever hear this sermon. There's a guy in Dallas, Texas by the name of Jim Jeffries. Right? He was one of the largest churches in, in uh, Dallas. Huge church. I mean, huge. And this is what he said this week. He talked about how that, and guys, don't, I'm not trying to be political. Please don't. All of, none of you know where I stand politically. None of you. Because I don't discuss it with you. Here's the reason. You know why I don't discuss my political position with you? Because it ain't none of your business. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter because we're not here to talk politics. I'm right. here to talk about the book. Right. I mean, I can spend my day up here talking about what I believe. But this is what Jim Jeffrey says. He said that the reason that there should be a wall because there's going to be a wall in, in, in heaven. Huh? Come on, don't, don't, don't do that. Because you know what? Out of context, he's 100% right. Because it says that in Revelation chapter 21. It says that there's going to be 12, it's going to be a wall, wall with 12 gates. So he's pulling it out of its context to submit what he believes in. That's what he's done. Jim, if you're looking at me, I love you, bro. All right, so let's move on. So let me tell you about me. And then we go. I grew up on Long Island. So as a result of living, growing up on Long Island, we moved to Long Island, New York when I was in seventh grade, I was exposed to many Jews. Because the Jewish, the Jewish population on the East Coast in general is pretty large. Right? So it's easy. I've won Jews to Christ. 
Okay? I've had the opportunity to spend, you know, in, to a lot of time with Jews. On Long Island, most schools are out for every Jewish holiday. Dawn just mentioned that last week. You know, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, all, all of those holidays, the school systems are closed. That's how many Jews they have in New York, period. Right? I've had conversations with Jews and know this much. First off, Romans 11, 25, most of them, spiritually, are blind. Mm -hmm. They don't believe in Christ. They yeah. believe in the Torah. Right? They believe in Judaism. They would make me believe that I need to be circumcised, not baptized. Right? And that's who they are. But God did this. He took this book and he placed it in the Bible specifically to them. It's called the book of Hebrews. So again, let's talk about the context of the book. What is the theme of, of Hebrews? What is the theme of the book that we're teaching? What is the book actually designed to show them, them this? This was it was. That Christianity is superior to Judaism. That's what the book of Hebrews is for. Right? It's, su it's superior to their Jewish faith. Although that may sound pretentious, is exactly what the book is teaching. Through the entire book, the writer presents Jesus Christ as superior to everything in the Old Covenant. If you read through Hebrews, that's what good. It's a consistent theme, right? And, the, and, and he systematically and logically goes through the book and shows Christ is superior. He shows his superiority angels to prophets, to Moses, and then to Joshua. He shows Christ's superiority to literally everything that is in the Old Testament. And there are things that he's been detailing and outlining so that by the time we get to chapter 6, in terms of the context of the chapter, it's important to realize that in chapter 6, he's not writing to Christians, he, and he is not writing to Hebrews or Jews who have already come to faith in Christ. See, because the minute that a Jew places faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he may be a Jew by birth, but he's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear me. Just like you, if you were black or white or Hispanic or whatever, you may remain that, but you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things become new. Amen. And if you don't see that, you will get caught up in protest. What the chapter actually is, is writing to Jews who had come. He's writing to Jews who had not come to faith. But what the chapter is, it's an invitation for them to come to Christ. He's consistently trying to say, Christ is better. Christ is better than this. He's better than that. His faith is good. You need to have faith. Christ actually came. He was actually the Messiah. He's the one who you should believe in. You should believe on him. And now he comes and he says, okay, I've told you all these things. Would you accept them? Mm -hmm. So let's look at the context of the passage. <clears throat> the passage itself actually takes us back into chapter 5, verse 11. All the way down through chapter nine, 6, verse 9. But what the context actually is, is the writer's fear or concern that these Jews, that for these Jews who have tried, have had their eyes open to the reality of Christ, and for them to actually be convinced that Christ is true, and for them to not make a decision concerning him, was their decision. See, they made a decision to not trust him. That was their decision. They were on the fence, and they hadn't stepped over the line of faith, but they hadn't really decided, and they had come to the point where the writer of Hebrews is saying this, you are at a place now where not to decide is to decide. And the passage is written to the Hebrews who had come right up out of the line of faith but hadn't actually stepped over it yet. He was letting them know that they were running the risk of coming to a point of no return in terms of their opportunity to receive him. And that's going to happen in the tribulation. But let me take a few minutes to show you this in the passage. In the, in the passage. So back in chapter 5, verse 11, 
He's writing about this character named Melchizedek. And he says this, of whom, and he's speaking of Melchizedek, we have many things to say and hard, uh, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you as dull of hearing, Jew. You ain't listening to me. Okay. What he's saying is this, you've already heard and you've experienced God working to get your attention so much, but your refusal to respond has begun to affect your hearing spiritually. So there are a lot of things I want to say to you, but you're not at a place because of your refusal to step over the line of faith. You can't comprehend it. So he goes on, he says this in verse 12 to them. For when the time you ought to be teachers, Israel, you have need that one teach you again. Hmm which be the first principles of the oracles of God that were given to you. In other words, he's saying as long as you've been hearing the truth about Christ and the truth about this gospel, the fact that he died, was buried, and rose again, and now you guys, you've heard it so much, you actually ought to be the ones teaching it, Israel. You ought to be the teacher. But instead of you being able to teach it, you still need someone to take you back into the Old Testament. And all the little pictures of the things that are going on and were pointing to Christ, and you are still in need of someone starting over again with the ABCs and say it to you. So when he goes on in verse 12, it says this. And as a result, and are become such <coughs> that we need a milk, that should be milk, <laughs> says mild <clears throat> and not strong me. That was the problem. That is what babies do. And again, because he's writing this to Hebrews, you can't make what he's saying here the same thing as what Paul is writing to the Corinthians when he's talking about them being babes in Christ, right? Paul wrote that. Mm -hmm. The Corinthians had come to Christ, but they were, here was their problem. They were actually Christians, they just never grew up. That wasn't the Jews' problem. Their problem was they heard about Christ. They came to the place where they had a choice to believe in him, and they wouldn't step over. They wouldn't believe. Right? They just wouldn't believe this Christ thing. Right? People, the Corinthians, uh, these were people who were babies, and they were still following the Old Testament system. The mature ones in this passage are the ones who would come into the New Covenant and express faith. So look at what he says in verse 13. He says, For everyone that uses milk is unskilled from the experience in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Yeah. Right? And he's not talking about immature Christians. He's saying, You guys are stuck in the Old Testament. You're stuck in a baby book. You won't grow up. You won't, you won't believe in the New Testament. You won't have anything to do with this New Testament. Right? And, and what you've done is that you're stuck in the Old Testament, right? And the only way to get the righteousness that you want, that we can, that is offered to you, is to place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you, you keep staying in this experience. But he says this in verse 14. He says, but strong me, that strong food, again, not the Old Testament picture, but the New Testament precept, belong to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. <coughs> Babies don't have discernment. Sure. Babies don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. They don't know what's good. They don't know what's bad. They don't know the, uh, if they should eat this or put it in their mouth. They put everything. They don't know if they should put their finger in a socket. They don't know what they should do because they're babies. You guys got babies, you know what I'm talking about. He's saying spiritually, that's who you guys are. You don't know what to do. You have no idea. That brings us to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. And he says, therefore, you babies, because you haven't experienced the righteousness by coming to Christ and the discernment that he's given by becoming righteousness in him, this is what you've done. He says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, which is what you did, you just forgot it, let's go 
on into perfection. He says, let us go on into perfection. Not, we're not going to lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of the doctrines of baptism and laying on the hands and of the resurrection of the dead, of the eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. He said, we need to do it. Okay, what he's saying here is this. Look back at verse 1 again. Leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, what he's talking about here is, is that the ABCs of the doctrines of Messiah, all the stuff that the whole Jewish system, they, they were teaching them about the Messiah and what he would come to do. He says, we've got to teach the Jews about the Messiah. We've got to get to the point where we leave that stuff and leave what? Leave all of the sacrifices, of the ceremonies, of washing, the feast days, the holy days, all of those elements which were pictures of Christ, right? That was what all of the stuff in the Old Testament was because it was only a picture to bring us to Christ. Mm -hmm. That's all it was, right? That brings us to the actual verse that we're looking at, right? So he says this in Hebrews chapter 6. He says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. We gave you the word. We gave you everything that you need. And have tasted of the heavenly gift. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And have tasted the good word of God. And the power of the, of the uh, world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again in repentance. See, they crucified them themselves, the Son of God afresh. And put them to an open chain. Okay, so what we do, so, 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 the, this is what we're saying. He pleads them in verses 1 and 2, 3 to leave all of the stuff that God used to teach us about Christ and stop just hearing it and start receiving it, mm -hmm. start believing it, right? Actually receive Christ because he tells them that they're at a point where all that God had done to reveal to them about Christ and who he was and who had fallen, uh, uh, he had allowed them to partake in. He says, if you come to the point now where you fall away, you're never going to get saved. So let's look at Hebrews 10, 26. He says this, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice. Again, I want you to notice that it doesn't say that after you have received the truth, but he says after you receive the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. After having that knowledge and, willful, and willfully turning our back and continuing in our sin, he said the sacrifices don't mean anything to you. In other words, you're not hopeless. God doesn't have any more cards in the deck to play to bring you to Christ. But then it says this in Hebrews 10, 29. He says, of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the spirit of grace for we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. You know what these verses are saying? It's saying the exact thing as Hebrews 6. And here it is. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put to him an open shame. What he's saying is this. You are never going to have more life than what you've already received. Right. Amen. If you harden yourself at this point with all of the revelation that God's given you and you fall away from the line of faith now, you're never going to step over it and you're never going to be saved as a nation. That's what the verse is teaching, not that you can lose your salvation. He wasn't saying that at all. Now, you can try to make it teach that if you do, but to be consistent with the passage and what it is trying to teach, 
He is trying to bring this nation of Israel, these people, from a place where he's done, God has done everything he can, watch this, through the church age, to bring a Jew to Christ. They get to the tribulation period, and God says, you know what? You walked all the way up to the line, but you wouldn't step over. So now, since you won't place your faith in Christ, it's impossible for you to do it because you keep wanting to hold on to the Old Testament law. And you know what most of those people who say what, what they believe they call themselves, in many cases, Messianic Jews. They come all the way up to the line. But they won't step over because they want to hang on to their Judaism. And let me tell you something. It ain't no different for you. If you want to hang on to your Gentile heritage and make it the primary thing in your life, you know what your problem is? You're no different than a Messianic Jew. If you're going to be sold out for Christ, give, give up all of the other stuff. Step all the way over. Don't have one foot, oh, I'm a Christian today, but to read, but I'm going to stand in protest for my Gentileness tomorrow. Uh-uh. You can't tote the line. Either you're in this thing or you're not. Either you're sold out for Christ or you're not. Either you're 100% new creature in Christ Jesus. You don't get to be one today and another tomorrow. You're either sold out all the way, everything in. One, you can't have one foot in and one foot out. There is no thing. It's no different for those Jews than it is for Gentiles. That's why you can apply the principle. You know, most of us, we, 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 we're teetotalers. We're not all the way in. We've come all the way up to this thing. And we've come all the way. But we don't want to place all of our faith in Christ. We have aspects of our life that we're not willing to turn over to him. We say that we love him. We say that we placed our faith in him. But have we? How far have we went? Oh, I love you, Lord, but I'm not giving my marriage to you. Because, see, I want to have total control of it. See, Lord, I say I love you, but let me tell you something. I'm telling you, What's going on in this world, you don't really have control over it. Mm. And I'm going to control it with my attitude. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? So we don't witness the people. Well, it doesn't work. You know, Lord, I love you and I, and I give everything to you. But when it comes to certain aspects of my life, I'm not giving everything to you. I'm not giving my children to you. I'm going to control them. You know, if, I know if y'all waiting on me for me to say finances, that's the easy thing. Most people go, we not, I'm not giving, I'm not doing that. You giving me 100%, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving you 10 Why you keep 90, why I keep 90. I'm not giving you that. But, but I'm, but I'm going to give, I'm going to give the guy at Burger King 15%. Mm -hmm. Right? But we give 15%, we tip. As a matter of fact, most of these people don't even let you have a choice. They automatically give you the thing and took a 15% gratuity. Yeah. Man. I think that's a good deal. Craig, we gotta start doing that here at the church. <laughs> Realize that's what the Catholic Church does? If you open the cat, they automatically take the money and put the check. But well, we won't be sold out for Christ. At the end of the day, that's all we have. We have nothing. I have nothing else. Right? My faith is in nothing else. My faith, I have, I believe I, believe I got saved by grace through faith in that alone. I can't add to it. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. I, you know why? Because I've tried. I've been there, done that, got to take the t-shirt and the book. And, and it didn't do any good for me. None of it did any good. That's right. 
Amen? This is my brother Mark Trotter texting me. Let's look to the Lord. Father, Lord, I'm grateful to you.